Today we're at my friend Austin's badass metalworking shop. Austin and I go way back. He and I took the same Doug Faddock bike frame building class and we kept in touch over the years. Uh, we're both from Michigan and uh, he got into some really cool projects. He works for Velocity and he has this cool shop here where he does all sorts of different projects. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to give all y'all a, a cool tour of what he's got going on here. You know, it all starts with the workbench. This is the first thing that I built and it's uh, it used to only be this section, and I turned it into an L, and then I built the shelf underneath. Um, so everything's kind of evolving, but... You know, you know. I, did, I did a bench video, and I was talking about copper soft jaws, and then <clears throat> I knock them off during the video, and it makes a noise, and I say, you should do something like, think about how you're going to retain the copper. Well, you know, yeah. Austin's a step ahead of me here. He did a great job. You know, they're, they're sloppy. You take them right on and off pretty easy. Yep. Plus, hacksaw right here, you yeah. know? It's not, it's not a thing in the past. The hacksaw is still relevant for a lot of random tasks. Totally. Uh, yeah, I saw your video and I was <laughs> laughing when you knocked yours off because yeah. I was like, mine don't fall off, but yeah. yeah. Um, Plus you got the work light right here. You yeah. know, that you yeah. got to be able to see how does that work? You got to know how that works. You got to hold it. There oh, it yeah. nice. <laughs> that's an old light. That's awesome. No, but I mean, having the light right there, that's, that's yeah. the thing that I want to add more light to my shop because I can see but when you can see better, and I've had that experience before where like yeah. all of a sudden you add more light and you can see better, you say, how the hell did I live before this? Oh, how yeah. did I get by? Why did I put myself through that? Yeah, lighting is huge for sure. Um, how do you like the, the so this is the porta band saw yes. with the swag off-road horizontal band yeah. saw attachment. How do you like that? I love it. Uh, it works great. You can make really nice cuts with it. The only I, I'm at a point where I want a chop saw. I just want to make, I want to be able to make a nice, clean, square cut, yep. just repeatable, not have to worry about anything. You can make a nice square cut. Like the technique is you cut like this one and once it cuts through that wall, you flip it. And it's and then, left a mark. And then, Yeah, and so you line up to that mark, then you cut that wall and you flip it. And you can work around a tube and actually end up with a really nice square cut. But yeah. But it's kind of fucking around. Yeah, it's finicky, and it's I, yeah. I just I'm at a point where I want a chop saw, but this is uh, extremely versatile. <clears throat> if if you don't want to use the table, you can still just pop the porta band out, and you're still using it just like the porta band would be normal. So I've thought about I might need to buy one of those in the future because I'm buying full lengths of aluminum bar and stuff more often now, and when I do, just managing that whole piece is more than twice as hard as managing two six foot bars. And so if you planned ahead and you knew roughly where your cuts were gonna be, you could measure off of one end and you could make a cut and then it would be two shorter bars whether it's exactly in half or not. And then hopefully if you did your math right, you wouldn't be left with a bunch of remainders. But um, you know, it, it could be useful sometimes to have something like that around to make these quick cuts. Yeah. And then to also be able to use it. I used to have a vertical band so I got rid of it to make space. So something like that is interesting to me. Uh, another kind of cool feature of my shop, I guess, I made this uh, this whole screw organizer. I'm, I became annoyed with how screw organizers these days are just plastic junk. <laughs> and I was looking around for like an old antique metal one and just couldn't find what I wanted. And so I built that, <clears throat> bought the U-line bins obviously, but... Um, that's yeah. where all my screws are. You gotta have that kind of organization. I got a system that sort of used to work for me. I have these little, uh, they're like a travel case with all these little bins in them. You can buy them at uh, Harbor Freight for like 10 bucks or less. And, and I would put different hardware in there and it kind of works, but uh, it's getting to the point where I have more and more hardware and uh, it doesn't, it's not the best system. Long screws don't fit in there. And yeah, it's always hard to find an organizational system that works for the wide variety of stuff you actually have. You know, you can think of like, well, this is the bulk of what I do, but then there's always outliers. There's always things that don't fit into the, the scheme that you create. And yeah, it's frustrating. Tell us about the, the press there, the shear. Stomp yeah, shear. stomp shear. This thing is super valuable for me. I end up doing a fair amount of random little sheet metal projects. And so... Uh, it's just a big pair of scissors. You know, yeah, it's just a huge pair of scissors. You just put something in there. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. So much nicer than the, what I had before this is just hand shears. So yeah. this is like huge. To be able to get a straight cut that's actually uh, easy. and yeah. yeah. Is this a ring roller? 
Yeah, this is a it's it's a sheet metal slip roller uh, with like a ring roller. That, I don't know. And this works just like on the same principle as the the rim roller that you had at Velocity. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. idea. You're just rolling, and then you're you're running your sheet or whatever, or your rod or whatever you're rolling. You're running it into this roller, which is adjustable up and down, and that's how you adjust your radius. Yeah. And it's just a hand crank. Actually, I made this handle. I, oh, yeah. I machined this. Oh, I think I remember seeing that in one yeah. of your Instagram this stories. This is the last thing that I machined on my old lathe. It's beautiful. Yeah, I was really happy with the way that turned out. Is that stainless? That's just steel. Steel, yeah, but it's a nice high polish, so yeah. it doesn't rust very easily. Right. And I'm always using it, so you're always kind of yeah keeping it clean. How do you like this model bench vise? You know, this is a wilt. This is something you bought new. It's something that I bought used. Okay. I do like it. It's a lot better than the vise that I had before, but it does kind of annoy me because it's not. Um, if you put something in here, a little demo. It's it slips on this end. So Oh yeah, it's it's not they're not parallel. They're not perfectly mine parallel. Mine are mine isn't either. Mine are all chewed up. I think that And you I, can just like okay, yeah, you know, it's yeah. solid, it's fine, but like yeah. I suspect <laughs> that uh, the reason that mine is also sort of out of square is just somebody puts something on one side and yeah. they, they just put a cheater bar on here and they read yeah. the hell out of it and then it, it kinda bends it. I think that's probably Because I got mine too. used too and yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, Wilton makes the machinist vice, which is real nice. That seems to be a fan favorite. Anybody who has one of those loves them. And uh, you know, for other frame builders, that there's like a four, four and a half inch, five inch maybe, something like that. Yeah. It's a nice size for frame building. This is a this is a model six forty five. Be a pretty good choice for frame builders if you were looking for something like this. Uh, this is my lathe. Uh, this is a Leblanc Regal. It's a fifteen inch with the servo shift. Uh, How does that work? Love this thing. Uh, I'll show you. I, I rent this shop. This is just a, a little nook in a much larger warehouse building. And in this building, I have access to 480 volt three phase, which is awesome. So I can run machines like this. This is my LeBlanc Regal. Uh, it is 15 inch. It's got servo shift, which is basically you just select your RPM here. And it jogs the. It's kind of goofy actually, but that's amazing. Yeah. Like I don't know if that's even that useful, but it's just badass technology. I know. My lathe has variable speed, which is really cool. If you've never seen how that works with the the reeve drive and the that's really the cool different too. sheaves, and it's like. But it actually is pretty awesome to have variable speed, but uh, it's almost cooler just to look at the technology, you know, like changing gears wouldn't be that big of a deal, but... Yeah, uh, this thing, I've taken the covers off and everything to take a look, and the way that it jogs the chuck back and forth is just like this cam, it's all, you know, of course it's all mechanical, just mechanical stuff. it's just like this that's cam awesome. mechanism that's working it back and forth. But. This I imagine would be a good size for uh, bike frame builders, probably bigger than you would need. Yeah. My lathe is a 12 by 36 inch lathe, which is a really good size for frame building because you can fit, uh, you know, like, you know, 36 inches between centers, which is plenty long enough for if you needed to polish a tube or if you needed to part off tubing or something. And then, uh, you know, like 15 inches. The beauty of this is it's bigger and heavier, so it's just more rigid. And as you take cuts, it performs a little bit nicer, or mine is a little bit smaller and more dainty. But in terms of the size, I think for a frame builder, you know, getting a, a little bit smaller might even be nicer, depending on your space considerations. You know, this is a heavier machine, so it'd be a little bit more work to move it. Yeah. I think it weighs, I think it's, what's this thing weigh? I think it weighs 2,500 pounds. So yeah. yeah, if you're moving it, it's kind of like moving a car. Yeah, I think my lathe is about half that heavy. Yeah. So yeah. Be the, tell us about the welding area. Yes, yeah, so this is my little welding corner here. Uh, ideally, especially if you're working on frames, uh, you, you probably don't want to back yourself into a corner here because I'm very limited on the size thing that I end up welding. And it, when I end up welding something bigger, like I just made an oversized coolant tank for him, what I ended up doing is I had the thing standing up right here and I was standing with my foot on the foot pedal and I, you know, I welded the whole thing right here. So it, eventually I'll probably build a different table or maybe bring this table out here, I don't know. Uh, thinking about the way your shop is laid out so you can work efficiently and be able to work on the size things that you wanna work on is important. But this is where I got it set up for now. Um, 
I've got a MIG welder. It's just a little Lincoln Weld Pack 100. That's the first welder I ever bought. And then I've got a Square Wave Take 200. Um, and that's the first TIG welder I ever bought. And that's the only TIG welder I've ever bought. That's what I learned on. Uh, another thing, especially when you start getting into TIG welding, um, is all the different kinds of rod that you're going to end up using. And I found that I had them, I was keeping them in the boxes, and uh, you, well, that's just not ideal. So now I've got all my filler organized and separated and labeled in these tubes. And this is just a really simple project to yeah. do if you wanted to do it. It's just PVC pipe. That's like $15 in materials. Yeah. And you just use the full length stick and you cut the PVC so that it's just a little bit shorter and it'll poke out the top like that. Yep. I saw, I think uh, Jody from Welding Tips and Tricks had a similar thing and he put a like a butt connector in the middle so that when you could lift off like this long of a cap and then you would have more of it extended I think. But the way you cut uh, that works yeah. fine too. Yeah. The only issue is if you put in uh, a rod that was less than full length, it would probably be hard to get it out of there. Yeah, I never put them in unless they're full length. Yeah. I end up with like this. Yeah, I guess you have. To... Like this is my used rod. Yeah, and then you just got to keep track of them and know which one is which. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mine, uh, I made a similar thing and mine kind of pop off and then uh, you can tip it upside down. So if you have a shorter stub of a rod, you can throw it back in there mm. and then when you tip it upside down, you have a chance of getting it out again later. Yeah. So something to consider if you're making a rack like that is whether or not you want to be able to also store the shorter ones in there. <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk about the, the tube bender? I don't even know what kind of tubes you were thinking of bending, like handlebars or? Well, that's the first thing I want to do. Was but this, I, this was yours, I think. Yeah. Sorry eventually built like up to like two inch tube honestly i heard you say on one of your videos recently about how you kind of, i think it was something tom lipton actually said where you're like you're kind of like uh betting that what you've designed is actually yeah. going to work you're making and, a wager this, yeah this is a major, major. Uh, example of that because i'm not <laughs> an engineer i don't yeah. know like none of us are except those who are yeah <laughs> I don't know like how much torque it takes to bend a two inch tube with an eighth inch wall at a six inch radius or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really just kind of guessing, but the first thing that I want to make on this is handlebars. So uh, we're talking about seven eighths, pretty thin wall tube. So I think it's going to handle that just fine. Yeah. In that case, it'll be less of an issue of muscle and rigidity probably and more of an issue of just tight fit on the dies right. and a good clamp mechanism that keeps the tube from drawing in during the bend. And if it's, if it's solid in those ways, uh, it'll probably make a really nice bend for you. Yeah. So you have a gear reduction box, and then this shaft will spin. You'll have a, a die that the, the the tube is clamped to, and a follow bar here that it'll drag against. Yep. Uh, what is going to power the gearbox? Is that a hand crank or yeah. hand crank? Yeah. Are you going to do, do a big wheel or? I want to do a big wheel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably won't even need that. It'd probably be just spinning it around. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know either. And yeah. if I'm getting into like two inch tube, if I want to do bigger tube, I, I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm just going to put the biggest wheel I can. Well, you know if. You need to know how to fabricate a big wheel like that. Tom Lipton had his whole uh, ship's wheel, a massive oh, yeah. for his uh, intaglio press that he was making for his wife, which is a great build series on YouTube. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he got uh, the, the spokes of it were flame cut and then he welded it all together and really cool series on how you would make a big hand wheel for, for that yeah. sort of project. What's the timeline for it? Oh, I want to get it done. I want to get it done this winter. Yeah. And, and what's so. the best way for any of us to follow <laughs> along and see the progress as you work through this badass tube bender project? If you want to see me work on this throughout this winter, and hopefully not any longer than that, uh, <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram. Go to Russell Makes yeah. on Instagram. You'll see me work on this and all kinds of other projects. Really, really good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Well, there's a couple bikes that I have. This, this one's pretty cool. Uh, it's a 78 Yamaha XT500. People love this bike. This is a super fun bike to ride. Just a vintage dirt bike. Um, you know, this is kind of my daily driver in the summertime. Ride to work on this thing all the time. It's just a 02 KLR 650. And you got the pizza box rack on the back. Yeah, I can haul pizza on this thing when it's yeah. outfitted right. Uh, <laughs> This bike, I've put a lot of work into. I've chopped the rear end of the frame off and made this seat. And this tail light is actually a mag light head, which is kind of a cool thing. Uh, the tank is off of a different bike. It's a 81 Honda CB650. That's a pretty fun bike ride. 
with you. Well, actually, another fun project I did on this bike, uh, and it was before I had my LeBlanc lathe, I had a much smaller, uh, it was a Smithy, is a just like a combination lathe, vertical mill machine, and uh, I'm on that machine, I made pistons for the brake calipers that are on this bike and they and they work great i made two new brake caliper pistons wow that was a fun project that was when i was first starting to get into machining so it was kind of a big undertaking because obviously you know i'm going to be riding this thing i need to be able to stop when we're talking about the brakes so. you need to be able to trust that you can actually exactly yeah. yeah this was a frame i made back in ooh, 2013 or 20 yeah 2013 uh, i made for austin and so it's cool to see it here in his shop. This is the only one that I made that ever didn't get painted, but we were talking about paint schemes and uh, you know, we didn't have a clear idea of exactly how we were gonna do it. And Austin said, well, you know, I can just keep it wiped down with motor oil uh, to keep it from <laughs> rusting. And that it's not something that I was thrilled about or that I would be thrilled about from a lot of the people that I build bikes for because I wouldn't trust that everybody would keep on top of that. But I knew the way that Austin took care of a lot of the stuff that he owns and he's actually like really on top of shop stuff and uh, you know if you actually stay on top of wiping it down with oil it'll stay looking pretty sharp for quite a long time but you got to be kind of uh, you know religious about it and making sure that you do that whenever you get caught in the rain or any of that sort of stuff um, it's just it's not practical day to day but it does look pretty slick to have everything exposed so this frame was you know brass fillets uh, at the, the main joints and I think this is probably the last frame I ever made that had this sort of uh, top eye construction or, or whatever you call it here where you tack the seat stays on the sides. This makes uh, fabrication easier in a handful of ways than doing fastback construction, but I just like the look and I like some of the some, some of the ways that the process is different when you uh, have fastback seat stays. That is definitely easier to do as a novice. Uh, it's easier to pull that off and get away with it in spite of the challenges that you face as a beginner. I think this was the first frame I ever made with disc brakes, and so I had to buy a uh, disc brake uh, brazing fixture for the fork, and I used these super heavy duty oversized fork blades because that was what I knew was not going to fail under the loads of the, the disc brake forces. Looks like you made a mount up here for holding the front light. I didn't build that. I think I put these mounts on here for the screws, but... Um, yeah, how did you go about making that? Is that solid rod or is that yeah, tubing? Yeah, that's just solid rod. That's really simple. I've always intended on making a front rack for this bike. I just haven't gotten around to that project yet. Nice. Yeah, I want to do a little build series on uh, racks for bikes, little cargo racks. I have a small, I uh, forget if it's 5 16 or quarter inch tube bender for uh, making racks and stuff. Well, I think I have two of them actually, one for each size. And uh, it makes it pretty pretty easy to make a little square platform or rectangular platform. And then the trick is getting the legs on. And I've seen fixtures that other people have made. You know, they build an 80-20 fixture or something that goes into the into the fork dropouts to hold it, so that you can, uh, you know, mount weld on the the struts or braze on the struts. He touched on the fact that this is raw. Let me just say, I know it looks good. I love the way it looks, and that's why I keep it this way. I do not recommend this. It is a ton of work, and I've done a ton of research trying to figure out what's the best way, like can you clear coat it, can you clear powder coat it. I've, I've read, I think, everything that you can read, and there is no good way to keep corrosion from happening. You, I oil this thing all the time. If I go out on a ride and it rains, I have to come home and oil it. You don't want to do that to your bike. <laughs> but, but, look. You can see Joe's marks right here, HT. There's where the yeah. head tube goes. That's a Sharpie just, from four years ago. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I love that, okay? I'm a shop guy. I like seeing the way things are built. So that means something to me, but uh, that's why I'm willing to put in the work. But yeah. if you're thinking about making your own bike or if you're buying a uh, yeah. handmade bike from someone and you want to ask the builder to just do a raw finish, there's really no practical way to do it. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, frame builders will post in process shots and you'll see the color from the weld or from the brazing or something and it's, you know, it's shiny metal and it's beautiful and you think, why can't we just preserve that? But uh, people, people have tried and it seems like pretty much not feasible. I think certain alloys of stainless tubing actually resist corrosion pretty well. Not every stainless tube does. So that's sometimes an option, like a stainless lugged or braced bike. 
But uh, for the most part, if you want that look and that finish, there's no good way to do it because when you put a clear coat or something on there, it'll just rust underneath eventually, sooner or later. Yeah. There's just, uh, you, what you need is like a good etching primer and they don't make that in a transparent. So this is the frame that I built in uh, the same Doug Faddock class that Joe took. Um, obviously you can see it's just a, it's a lugged steel bike. This is where I learned how to braise. I didn't know how to weld or, or do a lot of metalworking stuff before I did this. Um, so this is kind of my entry into into metalworking, into welding, brazing. Um, I was already into bikes, but this is before I worked at Velocity. I'm really making a career out of this kind of stuff, it seems like, so uh, it was a great experience, and um, this, is, this is what's left of it. I've kind of robbed some parts here and there. I don't really ride it much anymore, obviously, but this is the one that I built. It's cool, you know, you put the A23s on here before you even worked there, you know, it's just the, yep. it's the stuff that you were used to using and it's what was around. And the White Industries hubs, I love these. And have you met, have you uh, at the trade, sh you haven't been to that many trade shows with Velocity, but I've met Alec White at some trade shows and he's lovely. Uh, you know, it's really cool to, to get to meet the people who make this stuff, you know, yeah. like knowing you and some other people from Velocity. And then uh, you know, getting to meet Paul Price, who makes Paul components, and uh, just all—it's a small world, you know. Getting to meet Mark from Paragon Machine Works—that's my favorite part of going to those trade shows. Is you get to talk to all the other builders and the people from these companies, and it's just a—it's a small little community, and it's—it's it's really nice. You know, the people who actually make these companies and make these beautiful components, they're really smart people that you know are sort of driven, and it's really cool to get to know them. Well, thanks for showing us around the shop. It's pretty badass what you got going on here, and I'm sure it's only gonna get cooler as you develop more tools and skills and your ideas for projects expand. So thanks for taking the time to thanks, show man. everybody around. Thanks for the visit. Yeah, thanks for watching.